Good morning. Today our theme is language and we are Sandmark speaking. Blah, 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 blah. Come on! Good morning also on my behalf. It's nice to be here to give a speech. And would also thank you for the porridge. That was really nice. Thank you. Gave me a lot of energy. Okay, so yesterday I was making this PowerPoint and uh, you know I'm here for the first time. I, I, I used to study in university and you, and you had all these lectures about languages and stuff like that and then you had I was doing the sign mark stuff but now it's for the first time that I'm com combining language and sign mark together. So I noticed that ooh, in Finland in Finnish history influences a lot of my work today and that's really interesting and this is really the first time that I started thinking about all the connections and all the consequences that that, that that has. I don't want to tell you that much about history, but there's a few things that you should know about the Finnish history and the changes that we've had until today. So, this dude here, he's called Karl Oskar Malm. He went to Sweden, into Stockholm to study. And he, uh, he studied there with deaf people and he understood that in Finland we didn't have any deaf community or, or that we have a deaf community, but we didn't know, we didn't know that there was deaf people. The deaf people were all, all, all scattered around Finland. So when Malm came back to Finland, he decided to, to establish the first deaf school in, into Finland and that was in Porvo. And that was at his own home, in his own own ho house, he, he gathered five deaf people there and started teaching these deaf children there and that's when the deaf education started in Finland. So it's all started from that. And I was, I, I've also made a song, I've written a song about him, about, and uh, you can find that in YouTube. So, so when you started finding the, all the deaf people around Finland in, uh, in different cities, but at, at the same time, we had a huge issue coming up in 1880 and that was in Milan in Italy and they had a teacher seminar there and they, they just decided there they, they made an international decision that deaf people were not allowed to use sign language at all just, you, you just had to read lips and, and use your speech and that's it no signing at all so that had a huge impact on the world on the deaf, deaf communities throughout the world and, and we were really suffering at that time. Even though they made this decision, but still in Finland, the deaf community decided that they wanted to st still fight for whatever the world does, but they, they decided to start establishing deaf clubs. The first one was the deaf club in Turku in 1886. <coughs> and, and from there on they started establishing deaf clubs throughout Finland and it was, it was also in uh, opposing the this decision in 1880 about the deaf education. And I forgot to get to <laughs> tell who's interpreting for me here. So I have two interpreters here. So please stand up. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so, so Albert Talrut, he was really active in, in getting all the deaf people establishing their own clubs throughout Finland. And then they decided that, okay, we have all these deaf clubs around Finland and there's a, a lot of deaf people around Finland. So they decided they want to do an association for the deaf in Finland and that was in, in, in 1900. They decided, but in Finland we were still under Russia at that time. So they said that, no, you cannot, you cannot have an own association. So it took five years of fighting for the deaf people and, and in, in 1905 they, they accepted that the Finnish Deaf Association was established. But then, in 1829, 1929, sorry, interpret mistake, they said that people who were inheritorily deaf were not allowed to marry. The only way to get deaf people to get married, 
you had to have forced sterilization for the, for the lady if you wanted to have a marriage. Then you were allowed to get married with another deaf person. And that t took until 1969. For example, my mother, I have deaf parents. My mother has few friends who've had this forced sterilization done to them. And they don't have any children. Because the Finnish law was, was saying that you can't do it. But my mother has a lot of friends who just decided not to, <coughs> who, who decided to move to Sweden or to Denmark or to other countries or to other cities. And then they were just, you know, they were pregnant and then, then they were running off to and get married to another other town and then they com came back and, you know, then you could have the baby and then you could go on with, the, with your life. And also life. It was forbidden to use sign language. For example, my dad has told me about this. He was not allowed to sign at school. Also, in the, in the, in the recess, in the pauses, you know, he could, he could sign with his friends, but the teachers could not see that. And, and if teachers saw that you were signing during the recess, then the teacher asked my dad to put his hands on the table and would, ha would have a stick and would hit on the fingers or on the hands because he was signing. And, and then when my, when, when my dad went back home and told my grandfather about this and, and see what the teacher di did to me, then my, my grandfather would take his belt and hit again because my dad had been bad at school. Because my, my grandparents were hearing, so they didn't understand about anything about sign language. They just saw that they, they, they just thought they didn't think about it as language, the sign language. They were just say, saying that it was physical communication, so and it was not important. So at, in the 70s, it was time that the deaf realized, and also we had, there was deaf people coming from America to Finland and saying that we, we need to strengthen our, our the Finnish deaf. And also deaf clubs and deaf association They said that it's, it's enough. They were saying that it's... And, and they started a rebellion. And they decided to banish this, this oralism in school. And they said that we have our own rights as deaf people. So, I was born in 70, 78. And these are my deaf parents. And my parents had a really difficult history. They had a really difficult childhood and, and history was difficult for them. For example, I forgot to say, my, my mother, she's, she went to Kaisaniemi school here in Helsinki. And for nine years, she had to just lip read, not use sign language at all. And my mother said that the worst thing about it is, is that when a teacher was signing, a uh, teacher was writing something on the, ta on the, on the board and, and speaking at the same time. <laughs> so how can you re lip read at that time, you know? <laughs> Teacher is, is writing something on the table on the on, on the board, and you and you look at that for nine years. Woo. But anyway, my parents my parents sort of like managed to avoid all the bad things or or avoid transferring the bad things to me. They just decided to leave the past to the past and not bring it on to to their children. But at the same time, my parents couldn't help me that much because of this. Because my parents didn't know what was, what, it, what was tax. How do you fill out the tax forms? They didn't know that. Because it was all in Finnish. They didn't, they didn't have that good a command in Finnish. They would always ask for somebody, for my big, bigger brother or some, somebody else to, to help them. So in my childhood, in my youth, I decided that I'm, I need to do all myself. That I, I, need to be in, 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 I need to be responsible for my life. And, and at from the age 12 on, I decided that I'm going to be in charge of my own life. All my hobbies, all my travels, all I was taken care of by myself. And at that time, when I was young, I wanted to be an artist or I wanted to be a top athlete. And my parents couldn't guide me into that in any way. So I, I decided just to fight for myself and, and fulfill my own dreams. So how, does, how did the music come into my life? 
And I told you that my grandparents didn't know signing at all. But my grandmother, always at the Christmas Eve, she would play the piano and sing along the Christmas carols. And I was asking my mother, what is, what is Granny doing? What is that? <laughs> and my granny said, that, well, you, never mind. That's a hearing thing. You don't need to be bothered about it. And it, was, it came on in every Christmas. And, and in this picture, I may be seven or eight years old. I decided that it's not a nice thing to let, let Granny play herself. And I was asking Granny that, what are you doing, Granny? And my, my Granny said that she, she couldn't sign. And she said that everybody else is signing. I'm just playing here and singing for myself. And then I said to my Granny, when you're singing, would you please look at me, that I could lip read, and then I could interpret what you're singing. And then I started translating the songs that my granny was singing, and then my parents started signing also. And I realized that, whoa, music can really combine people, can really connect people, that it can connect hearing and, and not hearing people. Well, then I went to the deaf school, it used to be there in the, the Ressu, Ressu Elementary School. It's close by in, in Kampi. And then, then I decided that I really want to work more with the music and with the translation of music. And at that time, we didn't have any internet at that time. So I was asking for my hearing teachers or my grandparents or hearing friends that they would write down all the lyrics of all the songs on paper. And then I had these C cassettes, you know the old cassettes. I don't know if you're that old that you know old, but yeah, yeah, yeah you, you know, you know, you know, you had to stop and pause and, and write and, and go back and go forth. And then people are giving me all these papers. I had a huge pile of papers of different songs. Some like, something like Bon Jovi or New Kids on the Block and, and stuff, ACDC or Michael Jackson, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Madonna, yeah. I had all these different songs people giving to me, and the lyrics. And then I was also started to look at the music videos. And I could lip read what they were saying. That I was looking at the paper and at what they were singing and, and signing at the same time. And there's hundreds of songs that I've translated. And then there was a problem at school. We didn't have any teaching in music at school at all. And I was asking for my teacher that, you know, in the same school, we have 400 hearing pupils. Could I go there and teach, uh, learn some music? And the teacher said, no, you can't. The teacher can't sign. No, you can't go there. And I was like, whoa, thank you. <laughs> uh, the only thing that I can remember about music lessons, we had to sign uh, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, you know, like this. <laughs> And that, 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 you know, that's not, a, that's not, a, that's not an accurate translation if you think about it, yeah. <laughs> so I decided, I decided to stay on, on the, in the class, in the recess. And I was looking at the music videos there. And then, at ninth grade, my teacher came one morning and said that, Marco, you need to go see the principal. And I was like, well, okay. I went to see the principal. And there was a principal there. There was my teacher, and there was a psychologist there also. <laughs> and also the school um, curator. So there's four people there, and we're discussing about the principal was asking that, how, how does your school, how is your school going? And I'm saying, well, hey, everything is okay, but Swedish is not my strong suit, but yeah, never mind about that. So the, the principal was asking about what's your attitude to music? And I was like, yeah, I love music. And the principal said, Marco, okay, this is your last year at the school. And the world is waiting for you. It's time for you to accept that you are deaf. You cannot do music. You need to stop it. And I was like, whoa, thank you. And then I, 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 I had a written down warning. And I took that to my parents. My parents were like furious. Said, they said, we are deaf, you need to stop this. I was like, okay. But anyway, I continued it anyway. <laughs> and so I started, when I was 15, 16, I started going to discos. And I was always in the dance floor. 
and was starting just rapping, singing, signing stuff there. And there was a lot of pushing and, and shoving and stuff like that, Marker, mocking me, and, and I didn't care about that. But when I started to study in Uvascula to become a teacher, you know, that's the Master of Education studies, I started there in Uvascula, and I realized for the first time, I really realized who am I. And I realized what is my language, what is my culture, what is my history, what is my community? And I decided that really, I need to do something about this. Because in Finland, was going, because Finland was going to the wrong direction. And I wanted to, I knew that music is one hugely effective way of giving out information to people. To the hearing, to the deaf, for the, for the both. But, but when, when did sign marks start then? That was in 2004, in summer of 2004. And I was writing my gradu graduation thesis. And I, didn't, uh, I just didn't have any uh, energy for that. And it was a Saturday night and I went to party. And I was in a nightclub in Uvascula. And I was then again in the, in the, in, in, in the dancing floor uh, signing Coco Chambo. <laughs> put me up, put me down, put my feet back on the round. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I was signing that, and then somebody poured a, a, a beer on my head. And as I turned around, there was three guys starting to hit me, and they were just beating me up. And all the, all the music went down, all the lights came up, all the, uh, the, med medics. the medics came there, and all, uh, all the bouncers came there and saying that they were asking what, is, what, is, what was wrong with it, and, I, and the, the guys were saying that they were just annoyed with me. And they said that because they said that their girlfriends had said that I look good signing it. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, go figure. Yeah, but anyway, also the bouncer said that, you know, you all, all, all are waving your hands here on the dance floor. Maybe you're causing some hazard to other people who are partying here. It's better you go out. And I was like, me? Okay. Then I went out. And my friends came out also, and they said, that, well, let's wait and, and, and beat them when they come, come out. <laughs> but I said, that, no, never mind about that, I'm going to figure this out in another way. Then I went home, and I took a paper, and I started writing my life story there. And then I started doing my own music. And then I had decided, I realized that I can't do that alone. It's too big a task. Then I asked my friends to help me. And there was 24 friends that were volunteering to help me to feel, fulfill my dream. Half of, half of these people are deaf, half are hearing. And it was really a great experience learning from one another. For example, that all these f photographers because I had to explain them that you can't film like this or this, and you can't do that. You can't film driving in a car or, or, or film some landscape when I'm signing. You need to, need to shoot at me when I'm, when I'm signing. You know, there's a lot of, lot of thinking that, and a lot of things that we were teaching each other. And in 2006, I, I finished my first album. And I sent it to 12 different labels. And they said that it's not, not good. Then I borrowed some money from my dad. First, my father was asking, what do you need the money for? Do you want to buy a car? Is your car broken or what is it? And I said, no, 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 no. I'm making a, a record, an album, a music album. <laughs> and dad said, no. And then I said, well, hold on. I'm working. I have money. I'm getting paid. I will pay you back. And I was, I was 26 at the time. I said that I'm not, I'm not a kid anymore. And then my dad agreed to give me money. And then I ordered from Germany 7,500 CDs, copies. And then I was taking those to the bars and, and places and selling them myself. And at that time I decided I will, take, I will conquer the world. And not just stay in Finland. 
And I did one song in English, that, that one over there. I wanted to start in Finnish Sign Language and in Finnish language, because that's my native language. And I, I was not sure how, the, how rap works. So I think that it was a safe, safe way of starting. But I just wanted to do one song in, in, in English and also in American Sign Language. And you can remember that all the countries in the world have different sign languages as well as they have the spoken languages. So I started doing the rhymes. And I realized that nobody in the world has done this any, b before, before me. So I had to create the whole, whole scene. I had to create sign language hip hop and, and the way of doing rhymes there. And first you had to create the scene and then you can work in it. And I will tell you shortly how, how you do the rhyming in, in sign language. So in one, in one sign you have four elements. There's the form of your hand, hand shape. Any, for example, this is the sign for no. This is to no. So there's the hand, hand formation there. The other is the place where you do it. So you put it here in your temple. The third one is the mo movement. You do it like this twice. You tap on the, on the forehead. And the fourth one is the orientation, the way that you're doing. You can do it like this or this. It's, it's not good. You need to do it this, and then it means to know. So there's these four elements. And if you change one of these elements, for example, the place from the temple to the cheek, this means to ask. No, ask. Yeah. And there's a rhyme. Or, for example, to know and then to, I can change it like this. I, I, I change the hand formation to this. And this, is, this means stupid. No, stupid. Yeah, you, 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 and that is the way that the rhyming works. So, and then it started from there on. I started doing gigs around the world. And there's a lot of things that happened on the way. And I, I've been to the Eurovision Song Contest. I've been to the President's Independence, Independence Day Gala. I've had some awards. The, the, I had the Finnish Finland Award. And I was the young, suc young, young successor of Finland for one year. And... Uh, I, all these international prizes, I don't want to bore you with all the, all the little details. <laughs> but there's 44 countries that I've been to performing, and for 151 times, in, I, I've fly, flown to different places. And it's all over, uh, it's about 1,000 gigs that I've done abroad. That's going to be soon. And this, for example, is in St. Petersburg. There was 12,000 people there. This is in China. 45,000 people, and this is in Berlin, Three, 4,000 people there. So when I started doing those tra travels to abroad, I was thinking about what I'm doing. It's not just the music that I'm doing there. It's the language that I'm think taking over there, the, the culture. And I'm, and I'm also a role model to people there. And I'm also speaking about human rights and also taking the, the picture of Finland abroad also. And I decided that I need to, some, I need to find some, some other friend from Finland to do cooperation with. Because in cooperation you can build these networks and then you can meet more people. And then I met somebody with, who had a good networks. <laughs> I met Alexander Stubb. And I had 50 minutes of time. And in 10 minutes, I had told him my whole life story. And Stubb was saying that, whoa, Marco, slow down. I appreciate what you're doing. We have the same idea of value, values. Uh, what do you want? And I was like, well, <laughs> something nice, maybe. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you do rap music? And I asked him, and Stubb said, no, I can't do that. And I was asking that, when are you going to, where are you going to go next? Stoop said, I'm going to, to New York to a UN meeting, a top summit there, uh, with, uh, with uh, President Halonen. And I said, well, I'm, com I'm coming with you. <laughs> and we can do an, a rap together there in New York. And Stoop was like, well, <laughs> we'll think about it. And I was telling him that because when I was doing, you know, when I was telling about when I was signing what my granny was singing, the Christmas carols with the piano, 
and I started signing and then my parents came along and the music connected people and I thought that this is an important issue and that, that was left undone there and then I decided to continue it now with Stub. and I wanted Stub for himself to see that he can sign he, and he can uh, and he, like he can sign and he can bring the sign language over there so Stubbs liked the idea. I said that, okay, we will organize it. And then I got to go to New York. <coughs> and this is 4,000 people gathering around in Washington Square Park. Uh, President, sorry, Minister Stubbs was there. And he was teaching, teaching the, the lyrics and the signs of my songs to the audience. And people were like, whoa. This is the minister doing signing, <laughs> saying that you come on, go, go do like this. And after this teaching, we put the music on, and then we was rapping the song with all the people there in Washington Square Park. And uh, there was 12 different news channels there, and instantly it went worldwide. And the whole, whole America could see what's going on in Finland. Then Stoop said that, after this event, he said that I could be a special representative for him. And I was thinking about that and said that because Alexander Stoop said that because in, in human rights issues, as a defender of culture and language. Because you have also all these minorities in Finland, the Sami people, the Romani people, sign language people, and you need to fight for the rights of those people and the language rights, and you need to secure the language rights. And also the UN CRPD, UN Convention on Rights of D Persons with Disabilities, because Finland has not ratified that yet. Yeah. Alexander Stubb said that, you know, Marco, it's better that you tell it to the world what is your world like. You don't need me. I'm just a, just a normal Finnish, uh, Finnish Swedish person here, and, and I can better that you go there and tell what is, what is it like to be a deaf person. And that is why I became the special representative. And last week, I signed a, 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 a deal, a contract with the foreign ministry, with Timo Soini. Because Timo Soini has heard what I've done with Alexander Stubb, and he wanted, to wanted for me to continue there. These are the places that I've been with the, with the minister. Sorry, I don't have to the time to tell you that much about it, all the happenings, but it's been huge. For example, in, 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 in Kazakhstan, it was crazy, you know, you cannot, say, you cannot say the word human rights aloud. You just can't do that. You're not, you're not allowed. So, it's, so, so you have all these crazy experiences. But, but that is also the point in my speeches when I go to throughout the world, that is the meaning that I do there. And now, as I'm traveling throughout the world, I've always also noticed that in sign language, the status of, status of sign language is really varied throughout the world. And it's hard to change things when you don't have the common language. It's hard to, uh, hard to get your voice heard if you can't, can't the language. And that is why the interpreter services are hugely important, that you c can go to places and communicate. For example, in Indonesia, there's about one million deaf people there and about 10 professional interpreters. In Finland, you have 5,000 deaf people and 400 interpreters. So interpreter services in Finland are free also. In Germany, the deaf people get about 2,000 euros a year and that they can use for interpreter services. And in Germany, the interpreter hour is about 75 euros. So you don't get that much interpreter services there. So it's, it's really varies throughout the world. And for many years in Finland, for example, I would go to Kampi or to, to the railway station, I would see something going on there where somebody is speaking and I would go there and not un understand what they're saying at all. What they are saying, what's going on, I don't know, I wouldn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> a 
Okay, so now you understand my point here. <laughs> so I decided to establish an interpreter uh, company here in Finland. And later on, I will try to do that also to expand that internationally. And that is also one of the points why languages are so really important, that, that we can communicate. For example, now we have interpreter voicing me over so we can communicate with you. So throughout language, you can create emotions and ideas. And also in music, you always have those two languages. And, and you, can, you can do the music with, with uh, spoken, spoken rhymes and, and silent rhymes. And without language, you can't live. It's not possible. So, thank you. Oh, uh, cut it, cut it out, cut it out. No, 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 no. Shut. Why are you clapping your hands? I can't hear that. <laughs> this is the deaf way. <laughs> Thank you.